I think it's the job of the actors to bring the people into the theatre. If they manage to pull them into the theatre, then I will take them closer to the screen. I think that's my job. Sudeep, I am so thrilled to kick off Through the Lens with you. Uh, on this show, we are going to celebrate cinematographers. We're going to celebrate the art of cinematography. Uh, and I know, I know that generalizations are usually odious. But I have to say, in my experience, I have great admiration for DOPs. Because I feel, Sudeep, ki as a biradri, as a breed, you all are just massively talented, but also very gracious, also very generous. Uh, and the talent to ego ratio is superb because it's low <laughs> ego, <laughs> big talent. So I am thrilled to be sitting and having a conversation with you. My pleasure. My pleasure. It's, it's very inspiring that, uh, you know, something like this has been done. I mean, yeah, we also have stories to tell, but no one asked us. <laughs> well, we're here now. So I'm going to start with a segment called Five Questions, in which I'm literally just going to ask you five questions. I want to start with something that seems very basic, but it's something I grapple with, which is what is your definition of good cinematography? For me, it will be uh, something that uh, aids to tell the story. Eventually, you're serving the story. And uh, anything that helps you tell the story uh, create an atmosphere, create a mood, you know, uh, get into the characters. I think that's good cinematography. Because I've seen sort of very varied views, right? The first time I remember noticing cinematography is in Roja. Hmm. Mani sir's, yeah, yeah, of course. Santosh yeah. Sivan's yeah. work. Yeah. And I remember the backlight, yeah. right? And yeah. I was like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. I'd never seen anything like it. Yeah. But then over the years, I've read so many interviews and conversations where cinematographers, I mean, including Roger Deakins, are talking about how the best thing is if they don't notice your work. Uh, and you've said in interviews that your signature is there is no signature. So should cinematography not be noticed? See, it's a very fine line. Uh, it has to be invisible. It has to just serve the story. At the same time, the images can't be uninteresting. Right. It can't be. Eventually, you'll have to, the people are not watching it at their home. Uh, in, on their television sets and they're coming to the theatre to watch it on a big screen because it is an expectation of a spectacle. Yeah. Okay, one can't forget that, that you have to give them that too. You have to entice them to come to the theatres when they see the promos. But once they've come inside and once they're watching the image, that enjoyment of the image, the, the spectacle of the big screen, that has to happen in a very smart way so that it doesn't come in the way of, uh, you know, the storytelling. The storytelling. It can't be distracting. You know, sometimes, so that's a call that we as cinematographers, many times we have to take that, okay, you know, I'm really pushing the visual, but am I coming in the way of the performance? And that is something that, you know, for me, I kind of get a sense of it on the first rehearsal or on the first take. Uh, that How? I, Tell me. I mean, sometimes you do things like, uh, I know that, uh, you know, when the camera rolls and I'm uh, through the eyepiece and I'm looking, till the time of the rehearsal, I kind of operate as a, as a director of photography. I'm looking after the visual. But the moment the camera rolls, I forget everything else. For me, it's, I'm watching the movie. For me, it's like, it's now I'm watching the film. And there, if I, while watching the take, if I feel that my eyes swayed to something, or if I notice, I know that I've done something distracting. And you have to, uh, you know. Tone it down. Tone it down. You know, you have to tone it down. And then the other, sometimes it's the other way around, that you have to sometimes also distract the audience with something. Because you know, on a scene, something is not working then you know have to you know uh, you know still keep them enticed and you know you use some distraction techniques for instance uh, uh, suppose you thought that uh, a scene should be performed will be performed in a certain way and you lit the face uh, you think that you know that performance will come uh, better in that kind of uh, lighting uh, in a simpler way but then you feel that no probably it's not getting where it should get so you then sometimes i would change the face lighting you know maybe make it more dramatic so you add the drama in the you light. add a little drama in the light. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you described what you do on a film beautifully. You said it's almost like co-parenting a child with the director. Absolutely. I, 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 really, I really believe that. It's like how a, a parent would never do anything to uh, harm the child. Whatever you do, the well-being of the child is the foremost thing. 
and if, I think if as a cinematographer you must have that almost that parental you know uh, affection towards the child that okay I can do a lot of things but nothing I sh I will do that will harm the child. But so the, what stage do you get attached to the project mostly in most films and what is this process of creating the visual palette with the director? How do you arrive at it? So that I think with with various directors, uh, uh, it's different, different. It's a different process. I mean, like the, some directors. Uh, well, do not have a vision of their own and they expect that as a DP you just uh, it's entirely your call with some directors they have a notion which they start sharing with you with some it's a very collaborative thing mostly that's the case mostly that's the case most of the directors that I've worked with uh, uh, have, it's it's been very collaborative when, when do you get involved? I get involved the moment I read the script I start seeing a movie in my head and uh, uh, I kind of start sharing that vision with the director and there are many ways of doing that um, you know, you talk sometimes. Uh, to say with Mr. Bansali, it's always uh, I'll go on a recce and I'll take pictures. We start interacting. Through the interactions, I kind of get an idea of uh, someone like Mr. Bansali is very particular about not giving out. I think so, not giving out what he has exactly has in mind because he, I feel, doesn't want to influence my thinking uh, based on what he has in mind. So he's very. I, I have a feeling. I'm not. I've never really verified this, but I think that's a... You've done four films. Yeah, but like he would never uh, say exactly what's on his mind. He's more... I see that he's more interested in what's on my mind. And then there's a way that he would, very, in a very strange way, kind of give start giving hints uh, about what's on his mind. And you kind of, kind of have to grasp that. Like I spend a lot of time with him when he's doing his music. Really? Yeah, like to the music rooms and all. But that's, I think, I get maximum from where he's going and... and uh, from the music? From the way the he's approaching the music, the, because he also talks at that, that time. He's, and I hear him talk, and I can I get a sense of... You know, you spend start spending more time with the director, and you kind of get a sense of what's on his mind. And uh, for me, it starts there. So and he, then I start, uh, uh, you know, sometimes showing references, and he kind of reacts to it. He, uh, he, he kind of says that I like this, I don't like this. And that also is an additional clue to which way it's going. Then uh, the concrete work starts when we start working on the sets. He starts briefing the production designers. I'm there at that point of time. Um, and I kind of put in my opinion that, you know, how how I'm looking at it and, you know, whether this can be, the, the, this set works with uh, for me as far as lighting is concerned or not. Uh, and and by this time, Sudeep, you already have a fairly clear notion of the visual palette? Somewhat. Somewhat. Okay. He is... is It'll be in this direction. Yeah, but, but, but with Mr. Bansali, it's always it's a continuous process of exploration. Nothing is concrete. You know, it's like it's. it's, a, it's I've a, heard actors say that. Yeah. So it's it keeps growing. I mean, like uh, we uh, get to this stage with something in mind, and then uh, uh, we the set construction starts, and something else evolves, and then the sets are done, and we start lighting up, and something else evolves, and that, then I finished lighting, and the actors come in and they start started performing, and something else evolves. So it's a continuous process. Of and you evolving. don't lose. Your patience with this. I mean, no, it's, it keeps getting better. It keeps getting better. And, 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 and you know, we don't get this opportunity everywhere to, to you know, really uh, explore and to really uh, uh, figure out. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a luxury. It's like, you know, it's very... I mean, no, who else would indulge us like this? <laughs> but, so, the, over the four films, uh, and now I know that you guys are talking about the fifth, yeah. right? Uh, how do two artists, now you met 30 years ago on the sets of 1942 A Love Story. Yeah. You know, he, your, your own man as a cinematographer, he's of course a great director. How do you find this common language and does it become shorthand? Do you now by the fourth project with Gangu Bai, would you just look at each other and it understand? Does, it does, it does. But I think it's the, the fun part is that he's not the same person uh, the next day. So it's just always that pro pro just challenge of trying to figure out. And because, and that's, I think the dynamics is very important. I think it'll become boring if you're the same person and you're like, you know, it, 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 it'll become predictable. And it'll, I, I think for me, it'll become boring. I mean, the fact that he's very unpredictable is great fun, actually, because, you know, then there's always something new to explore. And, and does he push you a lot? Of course, of course. But, you know, I, I'm okay with the pushing because, I mean, uh, the pushing keeps getting me better. Because, like, on the on the 200 day of the shoot, if I'm not giving my 500 person, he's going to lose it. So, <laughs> you know. So he expects that uh, attention and I've seen that, uh, uh, that you know, it's hard, but uh, I'm only getting better. Yeah. Because somebody is pushing me so hard and uh, uh, it's it's very addictive, you know. And then when you work on other projects and the directors don't push you, you feel very... Uh, empty. You feel very empty. You feel that, you know, I'm not really, really 
you know delivering my full potential or i can do more you know i can i can do more and uh, but, yeah so uh, it's it's a little addictive i think that kind of pushing uh how what's the longest you've shot for him for a project i would say uh, in terms of number of days i think padmavat how uh, many 220 220 days uh but gango by took a lot more time because of the lockdowns yeah there were like long periods of waiting yeah. and like yeah 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 but on that 210th day you need to be there with all your passion and commitment like you were on the first yeah, and he's setting an example by being there himself like it's really, literally like i mean like he's and it is always a vision of you know that that the that that thing of a uh, vision of a of something that you're going to create that will probably remain and you push yourself a little more hoping that you know you know this is something that will that'll be forever remembered. yeah that that's yes. that's very that's very uh, well listen glory. the sequences you've created with him are just magic and we're going to come to that but before that i have to ask you uh, you've talked about how the close up is your favorite shot because you've said that my job is to get the truth out of an actor's eyes yes i want you to talk a little bit about what is the relationship of a cinematographer with an actor and how do you kind of uh, play with this and how do you i mean you worked with some of the most beautiful people in the indian film industry right you lit these incredible faces how do you make sure that it's adding depth to their performance and not just making them prettier you know uh, the human face i think it's a, it's a most fascinating landscape there's so much that can happen yeah. and when i read the script you know you have a sense of how this will be performed and you know that's a, you kind of visualize a scene and it's very exciting to for me to see that unfold on an actor's face and what they're doing i think uh, uh, as a cinematographer you should only concentrate on you know on extracting the truth of that performance because that's the only thing that will work i think that's the only thing that that will work that anything that uh, that in every way that you have to aid an actor give them that uh, uh, and of course uh, apart from that there's you have to you know make sure they look correct for me being correct is is more important than uh, being pretty pretty you know because because i i, I think that pre- no one's really interested in the prettiness i mean i yeah. think um, it's the character connect. i think i don't think it connects yeah yeah are there are there instances sudeep where you find yourself in conversation with actors uh yes sometimes again depending on your equation with the actor there are certain actors who can uh, take instructions really well uh there are certain some people who can get distracted by that so you have to judge that and i'm i mean some with some people you kind of do it as invisibly as possible with some actors who who can take instructions really well with ranveer it's like he just listens to you you give instructions uh, you know about face lighting and where he needs to look particularly we did a lot of that in on um, padmavat on padmavat as khilji i really wanted uh, the, you know there are a lot of layers that the performance had in terms of uh, what he would feel suddenly in a scene if you see that scene where he uh, is uh, with uh, his wife uh, and uh, after he gets a crown yes. that sequence if you see that whole scene what are the things that he goes through first that whole uh, thing with the crown and then that moment with uh, her on the bed and then the little interaction with um, jim sarp jim sarp and yeah. then he hears the uh, um, the flute the flute and it's some, something else altogether there's so many layers and so many things that is that's going on yeah. on his face yeah So you really need to uh, uh, know where so, he's so looking. So, so what? What would you tell Ranveer? I would really, really want to know where all he's looking, because there'll have to be. I mean, I'll need to put eye lights for to see his eyes, and whether uh, the face lighting is, you know, doing justice to. Uh, so, and in particularly scenes like this, which is very not very brightly lit, uh, uh, every position has a different lighting. So you know, you can really mold that and make it. Uh, you can enhance the performance. So. Uh, I would really need to know what he's doing, and then sometimes you would say that you know, I mean, at this point of time, if you can look down like this, there's a certain emotion that can come. And at this point, if you look up, when you can take this light, your face will look very different. So try and look here. I don't know. So you know, you instruct the facing positions and all that. So in a sense, you choreograph this with him. Yeah, the facing and things like that. And and uh, I feel confident to do it with an actor who can uh, say with Ranveer, he would like listen all of that, and and really uh, really hear what you're saying. and beautifully blend all of that without even and, and when you're seeing his performance you don't even realize that he's actually listen to you or you know he's just blending in it so beautifully yeah uh, it doesn't feel rehearsed yeah yeah but with, with alia when you uh, when i give her instructions uh, initially is to say that there's no response i mean i wouldn't know whether she's heard me or not whether she's but it she would like do it to the point i mean like like the know. facing is exactly right yeah there was one sequence in in ngobai where uh, you know she's being trapped into the brothel 
and Sheila was always holding her face and you know there was a so I left a small sp uh, slit of sunlight on her face and uh, the light is a uh, is almost a symbolism of you know her her hope her her dignity her pride everything and she would really want to cling on to that shush this in my mind it was like she would try to move toward the light and Sheila Masi would keep on dragging her to the darkness that kind of thing so I thought you know maybe if I tell this to her and it was early in the shoot I said maybe if I tell this to her uh, maybe she can, you know, help me achieve this. And you know, she, uh, and uh, when I told her, I didn't realize that she had even realized what I had said. And she like, <laughs> no expression. Yeah, okay, whatever. But I mean, like that. If you see that scene, if you see what she does, and then after the take, she came and asked me that, uh, could I manage? <laughs> I was like, so happy. Yeah. So you have to work it out with the actor. Again, depends on your relationship with the actor. You have to form that relationship with the actor. You have to make them comfortable. You have to make them. Uh, be very secure that they're you know they're safe in your hands and yeah. like, you know you're really uh, uh, going to look after them. Yeah, yeah. How wonderful! <laughs> That's so great. Uh, Sudeep, you were also one of the first proponents of digital, right? Yeah. Uh, one of the early ones. You shot Dhoom Three. Yeah. In 2013. Yeah. And I read this incredible story that actually. Aditya Chopra, the producer, and Victor Krishna Acharya, the director, didn't want digital. Yeah. They didn't want the Alexa. They wanted film. Yeah. So you. So they said that you know why it's why uh, this is a big budget film. Right. Why are you shooting on digital? Like why do you want to shoot it on digital? And you shot the same sequence with digital and, and with it's... film, and they chose digital, thinking it's film. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. amazing. So yeah. tell me, Sudhi, because I, as a layperson, cannot tell the difference. Right? Mm -hmm. What is the difference? Why should viewers think about this? You know, uh, I would s uh, say that film, uh, uh, I mean shot on film and projected on film is something spectacular, something fantastic. It's something so organic, something so beautiful. I just saw Oppenheimer uh, on 70 million screen in London, uh, a film projection, and I was blown by how beautiful that looked. Uh, for me, the, the, the thing started, you know, when uh, I, we had just finished Gozarish, and uh, this is a film which, uh, for the first time, uh, Deluxe Color had come to India. And uh, the first and the only film they have uh, processed was uh, Gozarish. And the final prints were out. And, and, you know, at that point of time, this was, I'm saying, 2010, uh, our main focus was the film projection and the film print. And DCPs used to come out. Some theatres used to have DCP. I, as a cinematographer, didn't really bother much about it because it was like some small theatre, some something called Cube used uh, to happen those uh. days. So we used to kind of give our main importance to the film prints yeah. and the others was okay, we'll, we'll still do it. And uh, Gozarish, the prints were out and these were the Color by Deluxe prints and they were so fantastic. I didn't believe it was my work. It was so spectacular and we were really happy that, you know, we were like really excited about the print quality and all that. To my horror, I realized that that print quality that I was really uh, getting so excited about, you know how many theatres in all of Maharashtra was required? How some many? 12 prints oh required. My God. In Bombay city, there were none. There was some Sona theatre in Borivali and something in Ghatkopur and something, all the major theatres had become oh digital. It was such a uh, uh, shock to me that, you know, uh, that this print that we are getting so excited about is like, uh, eventually this will be digitised and it'll be, uh, and then I realised that, you know, the whole, uh, uh, process of that going through, I realize it, okay, let me take a hard look at it. This is the new technology that, that's going to come, I'm not going to stop it. And the better, uh, I mean, the sooner I jump adapt. into it and yeah. adapt, it's better for me. Yeah. So I said, okay, let me let me get into it. And then I, uh, we went in touch with my friends in Aji and they had previously before that, they had come with the uh, uh, Alexa prototype and asked us to shoot it. I was one, one of the persons who had uh, shot a test uh, uh, with it. Uh, comparing it with film and uh, we at the cinematographers combine we saw it and we all spoke about it and uh, gave in all our comments. It was very diligently very uh, guys were noting down everything that we were saying and uh, and I was in that state of mind uh, uh, post Guzarish uh, prepping for my next film wondering how to you know uh, what to do and all that when these guys came back with a, a new version of Alexa and when I tested that I was really blown with what it was offering and uh, I knew the possibility and I was very very keen that you know if one has to uh, uh, get into digital then this is a perfect film to for me to get into it and you know it's a big production house they'll buy new equipments and you know uh, yeah yeah 
But, but, but Sudeep, do you think that at a viewer level, just at a layperson level, does it matter? Uh, I think it matters. It I does. Think, I, I think the image quality matters. I think the more organic the image, uh, the better uh, will be your experience of it. And uh, uh, personally, I try to, uh, I'm shooting on, on digital, um, I try to make the image look as close to film as possible. Which is what? Can you explain? Uh, I've always heard grainy use. Yeah, we use green. I use green. I use, add a little green. Huh. Uh, you know, I, I shoot it very much like I, I shoot film. I, I, I mean, for me, you know, having shot so many films on film, I don't miss the uh, the experience of that. I mean, a few things have changed. Uh, there's a certain sanctity of the of the shot. There's a certain seriousness with which people approached a shot, and also you know, raw stock was limited. There was they, it was treated very specially. Uh, that I miss. That I miss. But uh, I don't think I'm going to go back and shoot anything on film because it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I can create the same look. You know. Well, I, but but I'm still for someone like me. How do I tell the difference? You shouldn't be able to tell the difference. If you tell the difference, then the, the DP has done a very bad job. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, then I don't have to beat up on myself that as a film critic, I can't tell the difference between film and digital. I mean, if it's badly shot, then you should be able to be good. I mean, I've seen a lot of uh, uh, work which is badly shot, which right. just looks like uh, shot very generic. It'll look like yeah. what you... Flat. You, look flat. Like if you yeah. shoot on your phone, it'll look like that. Correct, I mean, correct. You're trying very hard to... Not look like not that. Look like that. Yes. Look, there's, a, there's a certain charm to watching a big image on a big screen yes. and and uh, yeah yeah no i get it well let's then move on to actually talking about sequences which are not flat at all which is some of the work you have done uh, i picked out four scenes that really really um, move me and mean the world to me uh, but we will just pull in the computer and show you what these are so Deep, we're going to talk about four frames uh, four sequences that you created and and let me tell you, this was really hard because you've done so much. It was so hard for me to choose just for, but I want you to tell me about this. So starting with Chakte India, uh, which is my favorite sports film and I think one of Shah Rukh's best performances ever. I read that this film, you were told that there is a lot of documentary, there is a lot of documentary. This, I know the Sattar minute speech is legendary, but this is my favorite moment. It's just after the women win. Mm -hmm. And I want you to talk about what you did here with, you know, the women in the foreground, Kabir Khan in the background, the use of that flag. Let's, let's just watch it. I mean, for me, that was a shot. That that's yes, close up. Uh, no, it's the shot uh, where you know the girls come huddling in the foreground, and that's you there, the right in the middle, front of the camera, and somewhere in the distance you see Shah Rukh. And for me, actually, that moment actually is a very sad moment, because uh, all the glory and all the, uh, the the victory is the girls, and he's the one in the background who will probably very few people will know his contribution, and uh, uh, for me, that was the truth of the scene, that you have to you have to. Uh, you know, get uh, that uh, a very personal moment for uh, for him, and uh, he's somewhere in the background. I'm not saying the girls are selfish, but somewhat yes. You know, he's in his own space. Yeah. And I, I thought that that was uh, for me that was the shot that that uh, you kind of discover him away from the whole celebration. So, do you, Sudeep, then when you look at a sequence, do you? Ask yourself, what is the distilled truth of this sequence, or what is the purpose? For me, you know, I have a process of you know trying to fight every scene in the film in my mind. I mean, not necessarily I direct. I discuss this with the director all the time. Sometimes I do, uh, depending upon my relationship with the director. Uh, but I mean, you if you try to fight a scene in the sense that you kind of think very hard on uh, what happens if I take out this scene, what is it contributing? That so if the scene is there in the movie, and then it's there for a reason. Either it'll, um, it's giving information or it's conveying a certain emotion. And questioning that, you kind of understand what needs to be 
taken out from the scene so you know what's amazing is is this expression of his and that close up yeah and you go from this euphoria to him to actually his, yeah you know physically falling almost following we yeah. are falling falling almost falling with the thing and i think there's a there's a great dignity with which this moment was shot that you know you're there with him and at some point you kind of move away let him be uh, uh, you know uh, because it's that that moment must be something to him you know yeah. that yeah. so many years of humiliation finally is kind of yeah and such a and that's sharuk this one look just just it makes me cry every yeah, time yeah, i watch yeah, it yeah. tell me about shooting a sports film so the what is the secret sauce or what you know i think one thing i realized very early into shooting uh, jagdeep and this was something that we were realizing because there's no uh, we hadn't shot anything like uh, like this before that uh, as an audience we used to watching a lot of sports on television and uh, uh, and that you have to make sure you're not shooting it like television give the uh, uh, audience a very different experience of and i can do that you know in, a, in an actual sports uh, i can't like do a steady cam shot around uh, sachin tendulkar at the last at the moment right? i can't do like a very intimate moment yeah. it always has to be a very distant gaze whereas in cinema you can do that and i thought that one must really utilize that i must be up close and personal with the actors with the with the players with this specific scene how did you decide that okay now we go in for the close up the the flag has to be just behind him are those conversations you and shimit would have we had we had yeah we had uh, uh, it was a beautifully written script and you got a sense of the way it was written uh, if you read the scene you'll get a sense of uh, that you know i specifically remember this scene that you know it's written so beautifully that you know while all this is happening somewhere we see kavi khan is there, just gazing at the flag i think that's always written yeah so i think all those decisions come from there that you know the that i need one shot where you see the euphoria and suddenly you discover him in the background far off and there's a shift of focus yeah where you see him yeah. and then you uh, kind of see him very distant from the uh, you know it is his moment yeah and, it's and there's, a certain, there's a certain uh, intimacy that is required and at some time at some point you need to move away from him you know watch it with a little distance giving him that grace. giving him his privacy yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay um, also in ho- in hockey particularly one thing that uh, happened is hockey is not a very uh, it's a, it's not like football or it's not like basketball in the like football and basketball or you know other a lot of other sports are very dynamic and you know there's a way that this played if you see hockey is played with a very small ball and uh, people stay with very thin sticks and they're looking down right and uh, i mean you know, when you watch it from there you don't really see their faces the faces are looking down concentrating on the ball uh, from the side you see a lot of bumps i mean they, <laughs> how to, do you make it poetic how do you make it uh, that was a big conversation that me and shimit used to have that how do we make this dynamic yeah. how do we make this look you know stylish what are the devices you know, how do i get actually on a on a sport that is so fast where the camp where the actors will be moving so fast how do i keep pace with them how do i still get their faces how, how did do you do it I mean, we devised a lot of things, a lot of equipments uh, uh, we came up with. Uh, things like we, uh, been, I mean, we had to move a lot on the field, and uh, you know, this being shot on the on the Olympic Stadium and the Commonwealth Stadium in Melbourne and Sydney, uh, they don't allow track movements, or they don't they don't allow put you know cranes or tracks or anything. So we had to resort to golf carts, and we would place uh, you know, ply sheets on which we would move golf carts, and. Uh, mind you we knew the uh, the movement really well because it was all rehearsed very well and and we were aware of where exactly the actor would mo- would move so uh, uh, we would move the camera something do a lot of counter moves if the actor is moving this way you do a counter move to enhance the speed and things like that and we uh, uh, designed a few things as i tell you like you know the, we designed something called a pole cam which would like a, a stick and uh, 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 arrow to so camera was uh, tied to that Uh, at the end of it and uh, i would be lying on my chest on the uh, golf cart and holding the camera out and you know it could really do fast follow moves with the uh, with the player or the ball right um uh, yeah then we had a wheel barrow kind of a thing uh, where we made something like a wheel barrow and put the camera uh, over there huh. and i could actually run after the players <laughs> uh, 
putting a wide lens without actually looking at the frame also because uh, I, yeah we used a lot of that and it sounds like fun yeah yeah it was, <laughs> it was very fun <laughs> okay now we go to the second one which is the most exquisite sequence yes this is just one of the most stunning sequences ever first of all sudeep how i wish i could do it again you know why i i, I you're finding fault with this yeah i think there's a lot of things that i can i can do it so much better but that's something that happens you know i, I feel i could light this much much better but it's so beautiful what would you do different oh i think i'd soften the lighting a little bit anyways i mean this like that's something that keeps you know keeps going on that you see something uh, you've done before and you um, i only start seeing faults and you know but i mean you have to live with it now it's out you know what i find amazing is this this movement yeah, yeah. At, yeah. on that curtain at the back yeah. and first of all that you and sanjay vansali had the sort of audacity to say we will yeah, sure. recreate mogle azam in a way right and then you have this shish mahal how do you do it how do you shoot in a space which is all reflective surfaces kiab i mean but you're seeing everything see those 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 are my skimmers with mitchi lights on it you can see all the reflections just that that's it that's them that's the, the skimmers being reflected in the mirrors i i had a lot of uh, these um, you know frames hmm. made with the uh, you know you know do you know what i made mitchi lights no acha the choti wali choti wala jo shaadi wali use hota hai so that those those ones christmas ones also christmas ones yeah, yeah. so Haan. so we used a lot of that you know Haan. tied on uh, frames and they were all around and they were providing uh, the the ambient lighting they were also picking up this little dots of reflections which looked so amazing yeah uh, yeah so and uh, sometimes we moved them you know that shot that you pointed out where uh, the door opens and you actually so what we had we had those skimmers on tracks and we kind of moved them out So you get those. If you see that reflection, that's right. And you get moving. the shimmer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So when Sanjay said to you that this is the plan, we're yeah. going to do a song oh. in this. It was scary. How it was exactly? First thing, they, What was your first thought? I mean, first thing is how do you hide the lights and where do you light from? And, and particularly if you see the set, uh, slightly later into the thing, if you see that the set there's very little, there's very little. Uh, I couldn't put a catwalk, and you know when you see the big wide shots. Yeah. There is no position for a catwalk, and huh. like. so it has to be lit in a uh, way that uh, for for one thing we had uh, which you don't realize is uh, a lot of the walls are actually uh, very delicately movable okay and what you did know, that allow you to do it would uh, allow me to see some reflection is coming because uh, a lot of lighting was coming from behind the camera and invariably they would uh, start reflecting so we had this little uh, movable wall the walls actually are slightly movable and it's made of very small uh, uh, you know chips of mirrors it's not one continuous this was that was one of the main decisions we had taken that you know instead of one big continuous mirror there will be all small 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 mirrors it looks interesting and also we could uh, you know turn it slightly give it a little angle to avoid reflections how did you light her she looks like she has a light inside her <laughs> <laughs> she looks so beautiful how did you do this uh, it's one soft box lighting her from the top uh, from uh, above the camera mostly um this is being lit by the opposite side the mirror is actually lit and that is reflecting if you see this is a reflection of the opposite wall right and most of it is lit with that principle and, and you're actually using the walls to you know just bounce lights on the walls right. so also what it does it it creates those really interesting patterns you know uh, and where how did you guys decide that it's going to the overarching tone will be beige a, a, a monotone yeah a monotone, sanjay yeah. was very very particular about that he was very uh, Uh, he kept on talking that you know we should try and do this uh, uh, this monotone thing i thought it was a fantastic idea to just, just try to try to do a monotone thing uh, i think at some level that whole fascination for the black and white uh, the cinema that both sanjay and me are we fascinated about i think um, i think given a chance we would love to do it in black and white one is that so the closest you can get is monotone <laughs> and because i mean different colors can be uh, can become distracting yeah yeah i mean here the only pop of color is what he's wearing just one green yeah and and yeah. what kashi bai has yeah. a little bit of pink in her yeah. sari but otherwise it's all the same yeah but it's just staggeringly beautiful and yet you look at it and see only faults you know, no one knows what i had in mind <laughs> <laughs> i had <laughs> <is> true 
This is true. I could, but I mean, that day, if I can. So there's always a gap between what you have in your head and what's on the screen. Yeah, sometimes, you, sometimes you know, something you know, you create something else. Yeah, but not what's not, in the head. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Do you also, Sudeep, get involved with the costumes? Oh yes, absolutely. absolutely. Tell me about that. You have to. Um, see, the art and costume are a large part of what is going to be your lighting. So you uh, have to get into it. You have to get a very, very good understanding of what the materials are being used, what they're going to do. Uh, and uh, with someone like Sanjay, it's very easy. It really, really lets you get involved in it right from the beginning. And uh, so, do you say that no, this is the color we should go for? I mean, I mean, this, it's always a, a discussion. You know, it's it's a very mutual discussion. But yeah, you have to be a part of the discussion. Otherwise, it'll be a very strange surprise on set when you see that oh, this color and and uh, yeah, 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 it can really throw you off. But I need to also know. not just the colors or anything. I think I am I'm, I. We have to give a lot of importance to the the texture, the material. Really? Yeah, because you know certain materials can absorb light, certain materials, materials will reflect light. And I've been very privileged to have worked so closely with Sanjay where I've developed a very deep understanding of that. Which materials yeah, work well. Yeah, yeah. And Sanjay is somebody who really, really, you know, pre-visualizes that. And, you know, he would, I've noticed that he would actually uh, uh, thinking about uh, putting a layer on the reverse side of the uh, Ghagra. Uh, because when it, when somebody dances, when it twirls, what would that... Uh, what will the twirl be? Yeah, and, you know, and then I have to understand that, okay, if... That is something on the lower level of the skirt. So it has to be a shiny material. Otherwise, I'll not be able to bring it out. Right. So it's a dull material. So what is the thread that can go? So you have to speak to the costume designer that, okay, you know, uh, this is great, but this is not going to see on uh, or show up. Yeah. So can you use a shinier thread? Wow. You know, so it's like as detailed as that. Yeah, yeah. Like for instance, if, if you see uh, Homer in Padmavat, that uh, that we really worked on the cloth and the material on the uh, on the stitch. On what Deepika's because, wearing. Yeah, because otherwise, uh, you know, I know when I'm... Uh, uh, doing the big wide shots, the lighting is mostly coming from top, so it has to reflect a certain way, and it has it can't reflect too much yeah. because then it'll be too overpowering. Yeah. You know. Yeah. So we did a lot of uh, tests trying to figure out that what exactly material would in that top light would be the perfect, uh, mm, you know, reflective reflection. Yeah. Wow. Well, speaking of material, I'm sure there was a lot of conversation of the material for this, which is, of course, the Johar scene from Padmavat. I believe his brief to you was a river of red, red yeah, yeah. going to the fire. Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. And I know this got into a lot of discussion about whether this was promoting Johar and we are going to put that all aside and just hmm. talk about the staggering beauty of this scene. Hmm. Uh, tell me about creating this. So, you know, uh, structurally, if you see that all of Padmavat is about uh, two different worlds and... Uh, uh, one is a world of the beauty, which is Padmavati's world, and one is a power, world of the beast, which is the Khilji world. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are two worlds which are threateningly, which is, and one is threatening the other, and it's always this. This is this is the drama, and the whole drama is going to the point where they would come close. I mean, the the, the, the beast would actually come into the realms of beauty, and and and. Uh, so this is the this is the climax that we are going for, and. Uh, um, it has to be uh, sad, it has to be dramatic, it has to be threatening uh, and beautiful at the same time. Yeah. Uh, and something that's sort of jaw-dropping, yeah, right? We've yeah. never seen anything like this before yeah. in any film. Yeah, we keep scheduling it and we keep pushing it on the shoot. That <laughs> Why? Too, I mean, I think we, were, we kept feeling that we are not ready for it. And then? I, mean, I think three times we we just pushed the shoot, ki, you know, uh, let's let's do it next week, you know, let's just think about it a little more huh. and and you know we'll, and and we kept talking about it that what what we should do and you know how uh, choosing the location actually uh, because but this is all a set all a right? set but i'm saying that you know choosing okay this will be, there'll be one shot from here this will be what will be the exact choreography like and uh, uh, then uh, then sanjay had the music made and that made a lot of difference this this music that's yeah. playing yeah. and so you actually have that playing while you're lighting no I've heard, heard it several times. In, huh. fact, in fact, before the shoot, I think a week before it, Sanjay gave it to me that you know keep keep it with you, keep it keep listening to it, huh. and uh, and that helped I think. Yeah. How do you decide, Sudeep, when to move the camera on a shot like this? Uh, also, you have to keep going between the scale of these hundreds of women 
and the one woman we are deeply invested in you know to kind of that's a big trick uh, yeah. thing that you know how do you make the audience um, uh, see what you want to see and uh, how do you do it i think it's a combination of lensing and lighting you lens it in a certain way and you compose it a certain way yeah that's that's something that should be very that you know there are so many women but you actually your eyes will go at her if you see that there is a movement happening this way hmm. and there is a movement happening this way and at, at that point um, of composition you've placed your central character and there's a way that your eyes will kind of go there's a rhythm to it and did you dis- did you help to decide all these outfits these reds no the shades? i mean uh, uh, i i wouldn't say i help to decide huh. i mean uh, but you contribute you know because some have the gold hmm. some have the embroidery yeah, and the time of shoot you kind of alternate it a little bit you know as per frame as per your lighting it's like you know uh, i keep telling sanjay that sanjay this part is i'm can you help me with uh, giving this this top shot oh yeah. my god You know, there's a uh, there's a science to it that you know that there's a reason why that uh, uh, the dotted print is put over there with a, with a certain stripe and like you know and and I uh, I get very aided by Sanjay because I would keep saying that you know this part I think you need to do uh, something so he'll go wait one second I'll just add the stripe over there and it kind of negates something I'm doing on the other side so right. you know it helps the composition yeah yeah and when do you guys know that we've got it. is it just instinct it's the it's the instinct sometimes um, yeah i think when the shots done on the on the take you kind of something's connected with you you, you know. know you've got it yeah yeah the last film i want to talk about is of course gangubai uh, in which it's not about a specific scene but it's about you playing with light and playing with white you know when sanjay told me about this film and then when i read the script the first thing that came to me was that that you know this film is really trying to you know give dignity and uh, and give empowerment to where it's not yeah. i mean these are uh, uh, people who are uh, marginalized who are uh, uh, who are not given their uh, uh, not given their due they are uh, i mean i don't want to say it like that but they are you know they are living their life in darkness mm. and there is this one character who's wanting to be in the light who's wanting to never lose it who's always you know pushing for that uh, uh, and whose soul has remained pure throughout nothing all her life experiences has not able to you know uh, bring her energies down and uh, so it uh, and i kept thinking that you know what is it that that i can add to tell the story of this so and the first thing that came to me was that you know you have to create an an ethos of darkness and within that punctuate it with light and punctuate her character with light uh, you know you just sparkle her with sunlight so that was my one of my main lighting decisions that you know there has to be the uh, gangu has to be about some the sunlight will keep finding her let it be like this that you know that you know strange there will be patches of light there'll be and there'll be always play of sunlight on her face did you uh, this was again entirely shot on a set yeah all the lighting is artificial everything all the daylight everything is uh, in indoor set yeah see the reason i'll tell you first the reason is that uh, these kind of scenes where there's so much street work where there's so much in, in twilight Uh, it's very difficult to shoot in real time because you you know take really time to set up a shot to choreograph them and, and a real twilight lasts very long uh, very little yeah the magic art magic art yeah. yeah also even you know day scenes and all that it becomes very difficult because the sun keeps shifting and you always chasing the sun so it's a very ideal situation if you can have everything in within your control so when i proposed to uh, uh, to sanjay he was like uh, initially the producer didn't got a little uh, worried because you know it would add a lot of lighting cost uh, but i mean we did a math and we saw that you know the amount of time that we'll be saving uh, we'll kind of square it up yeah. uh, and also you'll have the tremendous control over uh, uh, that you can do you, the your 715 sun will remain through the day <laughs> <laughs> you know the big challenge was to pull it off because uh, um, it has to look real and i'll tell you this there's a there's a twist over there now on set everyone gets very excited initially when it looks real yaar it looks like daylight boss it's like how do you know it looks like daylight now for me i used to think that okay the audience will not know that we have the, the audience is not going to give us a pat because ki wow you've created daylight in a studio for them it will be daylight yeah. now how do i make the daylight look very beautiful daylight so you start pushing the envelope you start uh pushing things to make it little 
more dramatic, pretty, more dramatic. And there, you have the scare of, you know, making it look unreal. So, I mean, we have it's to... It's a work, fine line. It's a very fine line that yeah. you have to make it look interesting. You have to make it look, uh, you know, dramatic and, and, and beautiful. At the same time, uh, am I crossing the line? Am I making it look unreal? You know, there are, I remember there are times where, you know, I've made the sunlight very warm. And I've really questioned that, has a hotai actually? <laughs> you know, when the light goes out. Oh, yeah, they're all yeah, standing yeah. there with those candles. And yeah. it's just, there's such tragedy, but there's such beauty yeah, yeah. as well. Tell yeah. me about that's, like, that's, I think, the ultimate metaphor of the film. That, you know, whenever you take the light away, they've still got it in their heart. Yeah. And the way that they're holding it and the way Sanjay choreographed it, that, you know. Uh, it was stunning. Yeah. It was really stunning. I mean, that's an, that's an image that uh, we had in our mind. That's, that's something, and some way we're desperately trying to put that image in. And then. Uh, on one of the readings, we came up with the idea of uh, uh, what if we have a power cut and kind of. It's, it's, that is one of my most favorite moments. That it's actually uh, summarizes everything about this woman. That you know that, that they'll still hold on to that light right. in their heart. Yeah. 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 So deep, we're going to the next segment now, which is three inspirations. I want you to give me three, anything, painting, music. Films, books, where do you find your inspiration? I think most of the inspirations come from life itself. You know, the, uh, the so many sights that we're seeing every day, so many sounds we're hearing, so many you know, faces we're seeing, and so much we're experiencing. And, and uh, all of this, I think, creates a bank of you know, images or whatever inside your mind. And, and when, you're, uh, uh, when you're recreating a scene in a film, You've read the scene, and uh, when you read it, you know something comes in your mind, that that, uh, and that comes from your life life experiences. I think. I mean, everything, every everything that you experience, that kind of. Um, so for me, I think you know, uh, life is the biggest uh, uh, inspiration that uh, that one should live with your eyes and ears and your heart open, open yes. to to experience everything, to take in all all of that. Because uh, and to interact with people and you know because there's a lot I, I think one can uh, one can give a lot of inspirations you can get by you know, speaking to people by you know understanding people but you know understanding by being compassionate to people so that you can you know understand people's emotion and uh, that's where I think a lot lot can come from. I would say that human tourism. <laughs> Love that! I've never heard that before. Human tourism. I think it's, it's. I think it's very. It's the most inspiring thing. Just other people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, having said that, I mean, uh, uh, as a cinematographer, uh, uh, you. Uh, I think I have. I have gained a lot from uh, from paintings, from from photographs, from other people, uh, from films. I mean, their paintings is something very. I, I personally am very very. Uh, uh, I I think I've really. Uh, Gained a lot of uh, insight from painting. I mean, there are some painters I've uh, followed. Who are your favorite? Um, you know, Rembrandt and, and Van Gogh and, and, and Goya. I would say Vermeer, uh, Caravaggio. These are people I've... As, they as use of light. These of light. are the and, masters yeah, of light. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and Hopper, hmm. uh, uh, one of my favorites. But also, I think I've, I've really gained a lot from, you know, looking at Indian painters and what they've done and how Indian their work is. And I find that fascinating that, you know... Uh, um, the the whole Shantiri Kitan school, what they did, and uh, from uh, the influence of the uh, the Western uh, painting, how they formed a style that's so Indian, and what happened out of that, you know, uh, Nandalal Bose and and Ram King Corbage, and the modern masters like you know Bikash Patacharya and Guy Tonde and like Sudhir Patwardhan, and I I really really enjoy their work, and uh, I've been deeply influenced by them. Do you watch movies? I, I watch a lot of films. I, I, I watch a lot of films, but I think I read more than I watch. I, I read. I think as a cinematographer, it has helped me to read because you know when I read, I start seeing images, and when I'm when I see films, I already see somebody else's images. But when I read, I, I see my own images. So uh, and I've always been you know I come from a background where when we were growing up as kids, we had no television, and uh, reading uh, books and hearing our grandmothers. And are you know you know you know just sucking up for stories. Whoever yeah. could tell us a story, so that has been uh, the that's a foundation. We, yeah, 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 yeah. So I I read a lot. I usually one of those artists who will go back to a certain film or a certain book or you know some one thing 
before you start a project? Do you get inspiration like that? No, no. 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 For me, uh, the script is it, is, is it. Everything yeah. comes yeah. from there. From there, yeah. yeah. Well, once I get a script, when I, once I start working on a film, I kind of stop looking at references. Like, because, really? Yeah, because that can be really be starting film. Because it, I think it comes in the way of uh, something original. You get... Um, I personally feel that for me that could work for somebody that specifically I'm doing this film so let me look at this kind of painters or let me watch these movies that doesn't work for me I mean I'd, I'd much rather let it flow no I think I think what will flow is uh, better it'll be more organic and yeah. more original but Sudeep as you're going through life are you capturing images I see a lot of very beautiful images on your Instagram uh, are you shooting constantly I'm are you shooting. always a cinematographer uh, no. No, I'm not always a cinematographer. Uh, I don't. I, I shoot a lot of. Uh, I do a lot of still photography. That's something I do for myself. Mm. I mean, the films I shoot for my director. Uh, the stills is what I shoot for myself. <laughs> is there a difference? Yeah, I mean, I do what I want. I, I do what I feel like doing. You know. Yeah. And I kind of. It's a very beautiful process of self-discovery. That I know. Uh, you know, I, I I just like to look at my pictures and I want to. I want to play with them. And you know, uh, it's uh, it's a good uh, uh, you know look into my own self. Yeah. You know, but no one tells me where to put the camera, which story to tell. You know, I go out in the street and I just capture stories. And for me, a lot of times it's like I shoot this. Maybe the other time, you know, the other day I was uh, uh, somewhere and I took this picture of this uh, woman sitting on a bench. And you know, in my mind, I start creating her story. And in my, you know, it's it's a fantastic uh, experience for me. So the as a cinematographer, you're such a critical part of what we finally see as viewers, right? You have shaped the entire visual language of a film. Uh, but most of the glory goes to directors and goes to actors. How do you make peace with it? You see, <laughs> uh, I mean, no, if you want, uh, I mean, this is the way it is. This is it. It is. It is. I mean, if you want more glory, then you do something else. <laughs> and um, I genuinely don't feel it's not less glorious. Uh, not in my eyes. Not in people who matter to me. I think we get the credit. Uh, we get our due. Uh, it may not be very uh, very evident or very obvious. But uh, I'm happy with what I get. That's lovely. That's really lovely. About Sudeep, tell me about music and how does that influence your art? I think it's very important for, uh, it's been very important for me um, because music is, uh, I think there's a very beautiful similarity between music and photography. Uh, like you have uh, the seven sores in a Sare Gama Pada Nisa or Do Re Vi Fasi Do. In photography we have a black on one side on white on the other side and with all these gray scales in the middle. and it's very similar to uh, a composition that you do with Sare Gama Pada Nisa and I do with uh, with my grayscales and I think a sense of musicality is very important because uh, to be a DOP to be a DOP I think, really? I think, I think that that sense of rhythm and uh, uh, and the sense of and the sense of melody I think these are this is very important I, I can't uh, exactly tell you how but I think it helps and and I have been deeply influenced by music. I listen to a lot of music. I'm a very avid audiophile, and I uh, and there are musicians who have actually inspired me a lot more than uh, I would say sometimes cinematographers. I mean, R. D. Varman for me is like somebody who uh, is my ultimate. Uh, it's a huge inspiration with what he was de doing with uh, music, where he was pushing. The, yeah. The, he experimented so yeah, much. Yeah. Yeah. And and at, and sometimes you know he did films uh, where he had to do. Uh, a certain kind of music which uh, I think he was asked to do in the disco era or something yeah. and over there I find how fascinatingly he brings in his elements you know you you listen to a, a film like Sanam Tari Kasam which is like a dance film and you see what wonderful things he does with that yeah. and uh, I am very inspired by that and what what are the kinds of apart from R.D. Burman what, what other kinds of music do you listen to? I listen to a lot of jazz I listen to a lot of Hindustani classically and I listen to a lot of old Hindi music and old Bengali. I, mean, that, I think that's everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But Apart yeah. from new Hindi film music, that's about everything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no. Some, I mean, uh, my uh, institute buddy Pritam is doing some fantastic work. That's right. That's it's, right. It's, 
it feels wonderful that you know we were sharing a room at one point of time at yeah, the people. institute uh, you no, guys no, were roommates no in thagur complex we were like up and we were struggling in bombay and he was still a sound recordist and i was uh, he was like a would be uh, a wannabe music director and i was like a wannabe cinematographer and we imagine that we would you know uh, we dreamed that we would work together on films and you know one day how lovely it's actually happening <laughs> How lovely! Okay, Sudeep, we're going to give you two situations, and uh, how wow. our knowledge of this, of your craft, can actually enhance our viewing pleasure. To start with, we'll do the various focal lengths first to see what uh, that has to do. Lensing decision again comes a lot from that sense of intimacy that I feel that is required. That sometimes you really need to be, you know, I, I can have the same conversation. I can um, have by standing right next to you, or I can have the same conversation and I can be far far off from you. Yeah. Um, and the mode of communication will change. You know, when I'm really close to somebody, then you know you're communicating in a certain way. The, the camera exactly does that. I mean, the if you tell me to frame the same thing, the same magnification can be achieved by various lenses. Yeah. But just a sense of intimacy will keep changing. Like right now, we have a 25 mm lens, which is a a pretty wide lens and uh, we are seeing a lot of his environment we are seeing the background and uh, and we'll what we'll do is we'll keep changing the focal length uh, trying to retain the same uh, magnification uh, but we'll keep taking the camera further back and what and does that do i mean that will be see right now the camera is very close to him so it's very intimate we'll change the lens please put on a 35 and so you keep moving away which decreases the intimacy yeah so now we have a 47 mm uh same shot we'll do it again okay what lens is this now so this is a 75 see magnification is one thing magnification is one thing where you know you how how close how you want to yeah, be yeah but within the same magnification there are a lot of other if you if the same magnification can be achieved by any lens right but so thereby the decision comes about your intimacy that how much the camera should be close to the actor because the emotion conveyed will be very, will be very different so now we are on the uh, 125 so uh, we'll see the shot again so this is the 25 the wide lens right and this is the tight uh, uh, lens this is 125 this is the 125 which is right. the tightest lens right uh, we have maintained the same magnification but we have gone much further back what we have lost out He remains the same in the frame, but you've lost out uh, all the background information. So this world you've lost, this whole world you've lost. You just become more. Uh, it's more about the actor. Right. So, And that's how you make the decision: can you afford to lose the world or not? Yeah, yeah. So the one twenty-five gets you closer to the actor. Yeah, and and throws out the background out of focus. Right. So. Uh, so your attention is only on the only actor. Only on the actor. Here on the wider lens. Um, the set is also telling you a story the background also is telling you a story uh, and what about the lighting what would yeah. you do differently so the, for the um, uh, for the second part we will see various lighting options and how lighting can enhance the uh, scene so i know what i'm trying to show you is how the uh, position of the face light that can uh, you know affect the image okay how like right now the camera uh, the, the light is almost on the camera so there is practically no shadow on the face right what we'll do is first uh, take it higher up keep taking it a little higher up wait yeah okay take it a little more higher up go close to him go close to him go close to him see how you're seeing more uh, shadows on his face his eyes he looks eyes sadder are, already yeah the uh, and also you've lost the eyes yeah now from that height keep uh, bring it a little lower bring it a little lower yeah see as as the light keeps coming down stop 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 as, as it keeps coming down you're seeing more of his eyes but the molding on the face is gone right keep uh, uh, go back again little more take it little yeah see now the jaw line is little better his face is getting better defined we'll get a completely different uh, uh, effect if we keep going down uh keep going down he's starting to look haunted yeah more more like a horror film <laughs> that's the that's what the height of the light will do right now if we uh, uh, come on the eye level and keep moving to the side ab thoda piche jao aur yeah now go go to the side you only see half of his face actually if you turn off the uh, that light it will be evident uh, it will be more evident yeah 
So you have no information on the other side of his face. Right. So, I mean, this could... If you want to show a character in conflict... Again, you know, these are things, these are very, uh, you know, typical norms. Right. But... Uh, this is the obvious. This is the obvious. Yeah. But you can actually... Uh, the audience has got very used to seeing the obvious. You can also do a complete counterpoint and, you know, if you see Kramer versus Kramer, that uh, the very macabre uh, the courtroom scene is shot in absolute bright, white, flattening, very flat light, which is a complete counterpoint. You don't expect that. Yeah. And sometimes when you do something that is not expected, that can really work. That has more impact. That has more impact. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we are always now trying to do, trying to look at it differently, trying yeah. not to do the obvious. Yeah. So for of course, you, you can't do like a like a hero in your lighting up, and she's supposed to look glamorous. And if you're putting in low light, where her jaws, where chin shadows, you can't do that. Right, right, right. That's too different. Yeah, <laughs> that would be too. So, in an ideal world, how would you light this? Would you go the other way? He's supposed to be sad. Would you go bright? I mean, that'll again depend the how the language. The of rest the of the script. Yeah, 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 yeah. But that's your first instinct is to go out of the ordinary. Yeah, something that would surprise the audience. Something, something that will kind of, uh, you know, get the audience... Uh, uh, Thinking maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Thank you, Sudeep, for the practical demonstration. <laughs> yeah, I wish we could do more. I mean, uh, uh, where, you know, I only feel that we haven't uh, done enough. Well, Sudeep, you also looked at Bajira Mustani and said, I wish I could do better. <laughs> so clearly, you're not a man who's ever satisfied. <laughs> okay, so the last segment is just what is your motto? What is your one line motto for life? You know, I think we cinematographers, we are doing something very important. And uh, I think we are recording history. You know, what we are actually recording is what will be left back for our future generations. And uh, I think that's a very, very beautiful work. Uh, and uh, that inspires me a lot. That it's like we're some kind of messengers in time. How oh, lovely. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, I want to do that very sincerely. So that uh, our future will have some idea about what was the world that we were living in. Yeah. Yeah. And and that, is that what you remember when you get up and go to work? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, when you get up and go to work, it's always, you know, there are, there's a new story to tell every day. And uh, yeah, just keep telling your stories because yeah. right? they're beautiful. <laughs> and and so we will be the people recording the people who are recording history. All <laughs> 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 right, through the lens, we'll record yeah, all of you. That doesn't happen very often. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you so much. My pleasure. It's been my such pleasure. a pleasure. My pleasure.